My name is Rosen Silva. Um, I'm an econometrician. Um, I'm a professor here at the University of Surrey, the School of Economics. I'm also currently at the other school. I've been at the other school for five years. Before coming to Surrey, I was uh, at the University of Essex, also in the UK, for about eight years, like eight and a half years. And before that, I spent a long time in ESEG uh, in Lisbon. I did my undergrad studies at ESEG and my master's also at ESEG. Then I did um, a PhD at the University of Bristol, that's in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and that's when I started my research career. So I'm essentially an econometrician um, and I do econometric methods. So not really econometric theory, not really uh, applied econometrics, but I develop methods that can be used to solve problems. Um, and typically I get a co-author that helps me with the synthetic theory and, and the difficult parts. And we use an illustration, uh, an application to illustrate the method, but I'm not really an expert on applied econometrics. So in, in my career, I've, I've worked on many different topics. Uh, quantile regression, mode regression, uh, specification test, and of course uh, I did some work also in, in uh, the econometrics of international trade and the estimation of gravity equations, and that's perhaps uh, the, my best known work. Um, it attracts a lot of citations, I'm still amazed by the, the impact of that paper, um, but I guess that's the that research, we never know the impact that our work is going to have. Um, happy with uh, the impact of that particular paper. Trail. Um, recently, with a couple of colleagues, we got a relatively large grant, half a million pounds, um, to explore the use of machine learning in the study of international trade, in particular in the estimation of the impact of free trade agreements. You can imagine with Brexit, uh, the impact of free trade agreements is something that is of, uh, it's very important. It's very interesting for both academics and policymakers. Um, and we have a fantastic data set prepared by the World Bank that can be used uh, to explore that. The problem is that the data set is, is, in a sense, too rich, and therefore we need to use uh, machine learning techniques um, to, to select the variables that are, that are really important. Machine learning is something that has been around in econometrics uh, for many, many years. Uh, since the 70s, I recently seen a paper that um, the Nobel laureate uh, Clive Granger presented here at Surrey in the 70s, and he was already talking about cross validation and all the techniques, or many of the techniques that we now associate with um, data science and, and machine learning. The difference, of course, now we have data sets that allow us to use this kind of techniques, um, and we have machines that are powerful enough to apply these, these techniques. So we already have some preliminary results. Um, a draft of the paper has, has, has been circulated and it has been presented at the World Bank conference. Um, it's, it's very exciting, um, but it's not going to be the solution for everything. Machine learning uh, has a lot of problems, as everybody knows. It's very good to construct predictions. So if the only thing that you want to do is to predict something, that's great. If you also want to understand how things work, uh, then machine learning is not so helpful. So that's uh, what we're trying to work on, to try to find ways of using machine learning to better understand the effect of uh, free trade agreements. Of course, these techniques are relatively easy to implement nowadays. It, uh, software, uh, data, every, every machine learning tools um, readily available. Lots of people are using the, these techniques and in general, they're using econometrics without really understanding what they are doing. And that's um, something that always worries me. Um, in, in particular, I'm very worried about the way we teach econometrics. We don't spend enough time um, with our students. We don't spend enough, enough time to explain the details uh, of, of the methods for students. Often our students just learn uh, what are the right commands in a given software, press the button, get results. They don't really understand what they are doing. And that's uh, a big problem because sometimes they can be working in, in, in companies or in governments and providing advice to governments and policymakers. And, and the advice they can provide may not be the best. So I see a lot of that because besides being an academic, I also do consultancy. 
and in my consultancy role, I often see the work done uh, by the other side, by uh, the, the, the companies against whom we are working. And often the quality of their work is uh, really, really poor. Um, and, and people that are doing parametrics and advising big companies and, 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 and European institutions, for example, often don't, don't understand at all what they are doing. And that's, that's a shame and that's uh, very, very worrying. So I mentioned before um, my paper or my paper with Silvana Tenjairo on uh, the estimation of gravity equations that has become very popular. That paper actually is an interesting story. So we wrote the paper without knowing each other. So I was in Lisbon, Silvana was at a Boston Fed and one day she emailed me uh, asking for an old working paper. And I said, well, I don't have that working paper anymore, but if you tell me what the problem is, maybe I can help. And we started talking about the issue and we wrote a paper. We wrote a paper without meeting each other, without no, ever uh, talking to each other, not even on the phone. Um, so this was done late in the evening for me because she was in, in, in Boston. And uh, it turns out it's my most successful paper. Why is it su successful? There are a couple of things that I think helped. Um, first of all, the paper provides a very simple solution to uh, a well-known problem. I think what makes the paper successful is that the solution is actually uh, very, very simple and everybody can use it. Actually, the paper could have been written by any second year student and it could have been written in 1985. Um, so what we did was not exceptional in any sense except that we found a very simple solution uh, to a well-known problem uh, and made it, made it available. When the paper first came out, there was a lot of resistance uh, to the method we proposed because it was a change to the tradition that had 50 years. Um, so we had to do a lot of work, not only to make code available to, for researchers to use it and to implement the method we proposed, um, but also we had to write a couple of other papers to clarify uh, some issues and, and to address doubts that uh, some researchers um, had raised. Um, and so for a couple of years after the paper was published, my main line of work was to address uh, issues that people were writing to me about, saying, how can I do this? How can I use fixed effects? How can I run test X? And how can I run it with this kind of data? Um, so on and so forth. Um, so we invested a lot. So we provide after sales assistance. So I, I still reply to many emails and many questions on forums on the implementation of the paper. And I think that's that's the key ingredient is that we, we provide a lot of support to people using our methods. 